The reality is if we hadn't have lost to Argentina, we'd be sitting here stunned and that would be the topic of conversation rugby across the world, that the world champions just got upended by Australia. So we spoke to Phil Kearns uh, a little while back, about 90 minutes or so ago, and the first question I asked him was obviously, well, what a hell of a result. After seeing that, after what you saw from Argentina, what was in your heart and your head? Oh, I think initially it was a, it's a fabulous win after coming back from um, that defeat in Argentina. And we all know now how good Argentina are as a team. Uh, I guess we should have learnt that over the last couple of years that they're they're a very good side. So I thought it was a good bounce back from our team. Uh, and I think really good from a side that's still reeling with a whole bunch of injury issues. Uh, you know, when we played Argentina in that second test, I think we had 20 test players out. So that means when you're down to 20, um, you've got five players there who are really your third stringers uh, in your test team. And uh, I think the results of that showed. So um, I think it was a very good result, but clearly we've got some areas to work on, which is our set piece, line out and scrum. Uh, But I think a lot of teams are gonna learn to realize just how massive the South African team is. Okay, well, there's a lot to process there for a start. I, you know, how important for Australian rugby was that win in, in all aspects? And also for coach Dave Rennie. I read a stat that if you'd lost, he was going to be the losingest coach in Australian history. So whether that makes a difference or not to the continuation of his tenure, I don't know. But overall, for every aspect of Australian rugby, how important? Uh, should I, I don't want to overplay that. Um, I think the circumstances of the injuries in particular, yes, yes, it was important. Yes, it was good to, um, it was important to show good character and fight. Uh, you know, the game in Argentina certainly got away from us. Uh, but I, I think generally in terms of the trend line, whilst Argentina was a step backward for one game, um, it was a step forward in others. Uh, you know, the first, the first win against Argentina was solid. Um, so yeah I mean it was important to show some fight and guts and they did that Phil Kearns, World Cup winning legend of Australian rugby with us you, you say Argentina, uh, we, we need to recognise that they're a good side, well obviously here in New Zealand we're licking our wounds uh, at the moment after they overpowered us in Christchurch but just looking at the results of, of what we've seen so far in the rugby championship, Phil, you know, you put 40 on Argentina, then you get belted by them. We get absolutely physically outplayed in Nelspruit. We turn around and produce this performance in, in Joburg. Now you beat the South Africans. That's their third third different team they've lost to this year. We, we lose to Argentina. That's the fourth different team we've lost to in the last 18 months, uh, eight months or so. Is the gap actually closing? Is World Rugby finally at the stage now where there's maybe, what, six, seven, eight competitive teams? Yeah, there, there is. And, you know, it probably goes deeper than that. If you go back and you look at Japan's performances at uh, recent World Cups, you know, to beat South Africa and then to beat, I think it was Wales and Ireland at the previous World Cup, uh, you know, it might even go deeper than that. And that's, that's wonderful for World Rugby. Um, might not be wonderful for, you know, the dominant nations, particularly in New Zealand, who've had such an amazing win record. It's probably a bit of a shock to the system. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know where the world rankings are exactly now, but I'd suggest something like France 1, Ireland 2, South Africa 3, England 4, New Zealand 5 and 6, something like that, and Argentina closing in. It just shows how competitive the world of rugby is really is which i think is wonderful from from the australian point of view i mean you know it's always a sport you're going to struggle with in your country because it's not the major sport and your young male athletes play afl and they play rugby league and they play cricket and 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 everything else but with the world cup coming in 2027 do you think that you know the, the this is maybe the kickstart of the impetus where it can regain a, the kind of foothold that it had when you were playing and the, and you and you were winning world cups uh, yes, yeah, we certainly hope so. I and mean, that's the massive hope of having the World Cup in Australia, to put it back both in terms of a profile piece, but also in terms of financially, to put us back in in a, a really good mind frame um, and a really good state. And, you know, that's certainly possible. You know, we, we're hearing about players from other codes, particularly rugby league, 
who were originally rugby guys, um, saying, well, we might come back. Um, and, and that's a really positive message. We're hearing the message from guys that are playing overseas in the UK and France and Japan that they want to come back. So to have, yeah, and there's, there's, as you would well know from New Zealand's experience, there's hundreds of them. Um, so if you can tap into that well, uh, it's certainly going to make your team stronger. Um, I mean, you know, Martin, if I had my way, you'd ban rugby league and AFL and then we'd have a pretty good rugby <laughs> show. I'd love, you to come, I'd, I'd love you to come out publicly and say that. That would be fantastic, mate. Man, I'll tell you what, you do that. You get the talk back going for a start. I want to go back to what you're saying about you need to work on your set piece, your line out, and your scrum. I mean, that's the most fundamental aspects of test rugby. Yet you still got away with a win. How did, the, how did that happen against the Springboks of all sides? Yeah. Um, you know, we dug in at, at the times. You just find something, and that was sort of the message from the team afterwards is, is just they found a way and they worked for each other and, and you know, you just got to look at Corabetti's tackle. If, if you want something that's going to inspire you as a team, then, you know, you see something like that and you, you dig in even further. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination our scrum uh, was bad um, and, you know, our line-out throwing needed a bit of work, but, but just against the sheer size and power of that South African scrum, uh, it's it's a hard thing to combat, and uh, and I, I just thought it was pure guts that got us out of that situation. Um, and I think then some pieces of really wonderful creativity, the James Slipper pass to put Noel Obasio through that break for McWright's try was was pretty special. Um, and the footwork from Corabetti to <laughs> to break the ankles of Andre Pollard, uh, you know, there were some pretty special touches there from from the Wallaby side that was clearly uh, under pressure in terms of uh, possession and and, uh, and go forward. Phil Kearns is with us on the platform, legendary Australian hooker, of course. And I'll go back to 1990, mate, when you invited Sean Fitzpatrick for a couple of barbecues. And we hadn't lost 50, 50 games in a row, I think, and we won those first two. You guys won that third one, then went for, the, I think, the skinny dip in the... Wellington freezing Oriental Bay or whatever but the point being yeah. is that there was a stake in the sand match for you guys wasn't it there was a real turning point and you went on to win the World Cup next year just in terms of I suppose self-belief more than anything that hey this team can be beaten and we can be the best in the world you know do you feel that that's kind of happening again maybe not with just your side but with the whole of world rugby at the moment given the vulnerability of the All Blacks yeah well I, I it must be a massive shock to the New Zealand public and, and to the All Blacks. I think you've lost six out of eight, which I'm probably not sure has ever happened in New Zealand rugby history before. Um, and, and it is a tough pill to swallow. You know, Australia, as you know, we've, we've had a couple of tough decades against New Zealand. Uh, and, and it's really difficult for your rugby public to, to manage that scenario. But I think it is a reality check that the world of rugby is evening out. The professionalism of the Northern Hemisphere, the size of the South Africans, the the ability, flair, and and what has been lacking in the Argentine game has been discipline. But geez, I showed some on the weekend. Mm. Uh, I, I think you know the the whole global landscape of rugby is changing, and uh, that's that's going to be good for world rugby. So I think that confidence boost, I think, you know, Argentina, having beaten Australia and having beaten New Zealand, didn't, uh, you know, so they're two out of three tests that they've won. That starts to build their confidence, just as it did when you're referring back to 1990, it did for us. Uh, so there are other teams that are going to be having a sniff. You know, Ireland, surely their confidence must be sky high mm. after their performances. Um, and, you know, so I, I think... You know, it's no, not only the whole physical presence, but the way you are mentally going into a World Cup starts to shift. You know, and how do you explain, Phil, that this is a South African side that are the world champions, of course, but at the same time they've lost to Wales at home this year for the first time ever. They lost a test to us in Joburg when for the last 12 minutes we had 14 men. Then they go to Adelaide, they get upended. I mean, where do, where do we assess them? I mean, on their day, as you say, they're the most imposing physical side that, you know, world rugby has seen in a long time. Malcolm Marks almost physically destroyed us on his own at Nelspruit, yet they've already lost to three different teams this year. So kind of put your perspective hat on that. Uh, 
yeah, it's just weird, isn't it? They they, they certainly bring out the best at World Cups. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, we saw, you know, going into that previous World Cup final, the England display against New Zealand, which was just phenomenal. Um, you know, described by their own people as the greatest English victory ever, uh, which is hard to doubt. And then they get demolished by the South Africans there at World Cup time, who were clearly in a better headspace than what the English were, who thought it was all just going to fall into place. Um, so it just goes to show how much the psychological side of the game um, plays a, a, at the moment. It's um, it's really interesting. So the Welsh will return back, and you know I, I wouldn't say that the Welsh are one of the best team in the world, but they've had some good victories. They beat Australia. Um, in November, and they've had that win against South Africa. The, the world of rugby is on its head. A couple of questions. We'll let you go. And we always thank you so much for your time and your thoughts and your analysis, mate. are just brilliant. When it comes to the coach, Phil, and you've been involved right at the coalface, all kinds of different levels, you, you, you know the debate that's going on about Ian Foster here in the country at the moment. How much of it comes down where you can pinpoint one guy? The way rugby works these days, it's not like when, when you were playing and I grew up as well, where there was one coach. There's 19 different coaches these days, nutritionists and PowerPoint presentations and everything else. The coach might even be more of a figurehead than actually a guy on the ground. I don't know. My question is, can it all be blamed all the time on one person? And can one person make that much difference if another one comes in? Um... Yeah, you talked about a lot to unpack. I think there's, there's massive debates over that. I mean, in my view, our players are overcoached in, in many perspectives. You know, as you said, there's 19 coaches. Well, how much time do they get with each uh, player? How much difference can 19 coaches make in a week? Um, can they actually really add value? Um, and, and whilst the days of just having a backs coach and a forwards coach... Um, you know, may, may be long gone. I think we've actually overdone it with what we fill the heads of our players with. You know, psychologists, dietitians, strength and conditioning guys, sprint coaches, your individual skill coaches, your forwards coach, your scrum coach, your backs coach, your lineouts coach, your whatever else coach you got. What an absolute load of crap. Um, the game's uh, based around skills and I still to this point the best skills in the world are in New Zealand uh, in New Zealand rugby in terms of your catching passing um, kicking high ball skills there's none better um, sometimes we maybe just overcomplicate things and and uh, and forget that those basic skills when they come together are, are, are critical so um, yeah, I, I think we're overcoached um, let's just simplify down things you know it's it's not rocket science what we're trying to do. Um, I remember you know, Bob Dwyer used to always say, you win the ball, advance the ball, maintain the ball. There's your game. I'm going to rubber stamp in that right now. Now, look, I've talked to you this whole time, and I haven't mentioned the B word, mate. You know I've been avoiding it, don't you? It's been since 2002. You haven't won at Eden Park since 86. We haven't lost at Eden Park since 94. We are rewriting history in all the worst ways with all that rugby at the moment. So it's a topic I was hoping to avoid until right at the end. The goddamn Bledisloe Cup, Phil. Yeah, I, I think for us, uh, you know, I certainly won't be making any calls on that out until we can actually see what our team's going to look like. Uh, you know, we've, we've lost Quade Cooper and Angus Bell and we lost both hookers up until last week and and we didn't. We still don't have Isaac Rodder back, and you know, there's um, Karevi's out, and there's just a whole bunch more. Uh, and Kelway's just come back from injury. So if we can get a full team, if we can get a full team on the park, it'll be a very competitive series. Uh, I, I'm not downplaying uh, the strength of the All Blacks at all. And at Bledisloe Cup time, it makes a hell of a lot of difference to both to both countries. Um, you know, I never won a match on Eden Park, whether it was against Auckland or whether it was against New Zealand. Um, so I'm not a fan of the place, put it that way. Um, but, you know, it's just a rugby ground. Um, but I think, I think for most other years, we could safely say New Zealand were the favourites. Maybe not this time.